So let's, uh, we're going to actually be singing him 425, 425. Let's just have a little opening prayer first. We thank and praise you, Heavenly Father, for the gift of your word. That word that is eternal, it stands forever. Even though this whole uh, creation will pass away, your word goes on. We beg of you by your Holy Spirit to work in and through your word to lift us up as your dear children, to bring um, your good news of salvation to us and that we would be attentive to all of the good gifts that you have for us as we study your word today in the book of Romans. We lift this up in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, we are on um, M425, which is when I survey the wondrous cross. And... Uh, we've got hymnals out. We had a bunch of new hymnals dedicated, so yeah. you must not have got them passed out to your part of the world there, huh, Mary? <laughs> yeah, she's got one. Okay. chapter 1, and we are going to pick that up at verse 16. So let me get the little piece of paper up here. There we go. All right. Book of Romans. Perfect. All right. So as we look at this, um, 
in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, really are kind of the, the theme statement that um, the Apostle Paul is going to chase all the way through. Okay. I need to get to Romans chapter 1. Here we go. So verses 16 and 17, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So as we kind of think about all of that, as we look at this, earlier Paul says, I hope to come to you so we can encourage one another in the gospel. And here it is. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it saves people. And recognize that as God's people, as Christians, we have that unique message. God came to save us. His son, Jesus Christ, took on our humanity, paid the price that we owed but could not pay so that we might enjoy eternity with him. You look at any other religious system, and it's all, what do we have to do to satisfy God? In Christianity, God recognizes we can do nothing because we're spiritually dead. So he takes the initiative here. So ultimately, this idea here of the gospel and not being ashamed um, on your sheets, there are some words from Jesus there from Luke chapter 9. Now, we do find these in other Gospels as well, but they're right there. Or you can look in your Bible at Luke chapter 9, starting at verse 23. And Jesus said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, we sometimes hear those words. And we go, oh, yeah, we got that. Yeah. Jesus is speaking in a context where the cross was an instrument of horrible torture and death. One of the ways the Romans would do that, typically, not always, but typically, is they would make the condemned carry the cross beam of the cross from wherever the court took place to the place of execution. And the one thing about Roman justice was this, is when your case was decided and sentence was pronounced, it was carried out immediately. So if you were pronounced not guilty, you're free to go. If you're pronounced guilty and you're going to be beaten, that happens right now. If you're pronounced guilty and you're going to be killed, whatever way the court says that's going to happen, it happens right now. Was there one more than one place that they executed? Um, they typically would do that wherever they happen to be. And, and I think in Jerusalem, they probably had a single spot outside the city where they would carry that out, right? And recognize the Jewish people had kind of a special dispensation from Rome and we talked about that on a couple of weeks ago where they made a treaty with Rome before Rome became a superpower. And so Rome allowed them to keep their temple, keep their way of worship. One of the things Rome did not allow them to keep was the death penalty. If the Jews had still had the death penalty, Jesus would have been stoned. That was the way they carried that out. The Romans said, no. Nope. You can exercise a certain amount of legal control over the city of Jerusalem, but we reserve the right. If you think somebody deserves death, you have to come to us and convince us. And if we're convinced, then we'll kill them for it. 
So Got no it. appeal system. <laughs> um, well, the only thing that could happen is if a defendant was a Roman citizen and they were on trial and they were thinking this is not going well, they could appeal to Caesar. They had that right. So let me give you an example of when this happens in the scripture. Paul comes to the temple in Jerusalem after his missionary journeys. There's a little riot, you know, and it comes out in that that he's a Roman citizen. And it also comes out in that that there's a group of people in Jerusalem who have sworn to kill him. So the centurion loads him up with 200 Roman soldiers in the middle of the night and sends him to Caesarea. So the governor that's there at the time, which I think was Festus, if I'm remembering my governors correctly. It was Festus. Yeah, okay. Yep. Somebody's got me, got my back on that. Here's the case. Realizes Paul is innocent, but kind of likes to hear what he has to say. Is also looking for a bribe and is a favor to the Jews to keep them happy, keeps them in jail. So Felix comes along, who's a brand new governor. Right? And it's, oh, by the way, there's this guy in jail. Here he is. So Felix is trying to figure this out, and he calls for the Jewish authorities to come down. And the Jewish authorities say, you know, we really should have this trial in Jerusalem, intending to ambush him and kill him on the way. Paul knows what their game is. And so he appeals to Caesar. And Felix is like, well, the law is the law. He's a Roman citizen. If he appeals to Caesar, he's got to go to Caesar. He's got to go to Rome. His confusion, though, is what do I write? Because <laughs> you have to send a bill of indictment, right? And he's listening to this case and he's going, they're arguing about their religion. I have no idea what these people are talking about. So this is where you get um, Agrippa, I think, was the king, and Bernice, his wife. his wife, and they were visiting the new governor, right? He says, hey, I got this prisoner. I got to send him to Rome. And Agrippa says, hey, I'd love to hear him. And Paul immediately tries to convert him, right? And Felix yeah. has gone, Paul, you've lost your mind. He says, no, no, no. This is not happening in the corner. Agrippa knows exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. And afterward, the two of them conclude, you know, if this man had not appealed to Caesar, he could have been set free. He would not have survived those trip to Jerusalem, right? So, so this is the way it worked, right? So when Jesus says, take up your cross, take up this instrument of death and torture and follow me. Whew. One of the things that struck me in this this time was that little word daily. 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 <laughs> Every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a reminder that we have to remind ourselves daily. And, and this is perhaps one of the places I mean, I don't know, you know, the Holy Spirit worked through Martin Luther to write that little small catechism thing, um, you know, where when he talks about baptism in the catechism, what does he say? That we should daily drown the old Adam, that old sinner, and let the new person arise. The Holy Spirit's going to take care of that. But what is that? That's a daily taking up your cross, right? I have to kill the sinful nature that still lives in me. Now, I know it's been taken care of on the cross. I know it's all been paid for. As we are still in this life, we are at the same time sinner and saint. That old sinful person clings to us until we see Jesus face to face. And that's why... You know, sometimes within the Christian church, sometimes people look at sin and they don't think it's that big of a deal. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, it is. Living in all of us is the breaking of every commandment. I want to be God. Okay. I don't want to obey authority. You know the murderer, the adulterer, the thief, the gossip, all of that lives in me. All of that lives in me. And it is a daily battle. Now, the Holy Spirit is stronger unless I quench in the Holy Spirit, right? 
Um, Old England. A man was on trial basically for his life because he had been accused of witchcraft. Why was he accused of witchcraft? Because in the day they did dog fights and he had a pair of fighting dogs and they would bet on which dog would win. And inevitably he always had the winner. I mean, he owned the dogs, he always had the winner. It was never the same dog, right? It would, it would change. And eventually he was accused of discerning this by witchcraft. And when he realized that he was about to be executed as a witch, he said, no, 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 it's not witchcraft. The dog I feed is the one that always wins. Got it? Now he was still in big trouble for fraud, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but he got to live through it, all right? And the same thing is true, which nature am I feeding? Mm. Am I feeding the sinful nature or am I feeding that new nature in Jesus? And in Romans, there's a little passage where, it, well, we'll get there eventually, where it says, don't pay any attention, you know, don't satisfy the things of the flesh, but instead serve Christ. And ultimately, that's, that's the struggle we all live in, right? Mm -hmm. This is the struggle we all live in. Which one are we feeding today? Which one are we feeding at the moment? Because throughout the day, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Yeah, feeding the old nature now. Whoops, better stop that. <laughs> you know, that's what repentance is all about. So ultimately, when Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me, he's saying it's to kill that old sinful nature. He goes on, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So we're not losing our life indiscriminately. We're losing it for the sake of Jesus. Lord Jesus, I am walking with you wherever that goes. I'm not going to seek trouble. If it comes on account of your name, I'm going to count that as a blessing, which is, that's a hard one to get around, right? Um, he goes on to say, for what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Ah. So you can have all the money in the world, but if you don't know Jesus, it's useless. Mm -hmm. It's useless. That's your treasure. Yeah. Well, and, and it's dust, right? Which is eventually going to be turned into ash. <laughs> so um, he goes on, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the Holy Angels. He's pointing ahead. I'm coming back. Now, this is before the crucifixion. This is before his resurrection, before the ascension, where the angel says, hey, the way you saw him go, he's coming back. He's already saying, when I return, if you've been ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you, right? And ultimately, as his people, even though there may have been events in our life where we should have spoken up for Jesus and didn't, all of us probably have those, right? Mm -hmm. There is forgiveness for all of that. And think about it this way. If I am walking into this building on a Thursday night or Sunday morning, what am I doing? I'm witnessing, right? Oh, yeah. My presence is a witness. Sometimes we think witnessing means, that, well, I have to go down here to these really scary people who hate everybody who's breathing other than them and tell them about Jesus. Not necessarily. Now, some are called to do that. But we are called to witness wherever we are, right? You know, that's one of the reasons, like yesterday when I talked to my mom, I was like, well, I got Bible study in the morning. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't an in-your-face, hey, but it was. Just in the simplicity of saying, I've got Bible study in the morning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. And, and recognize that living as Jesus' disciple is sometimes about some very things that we would routinely treat as insignificant. Right? 
So in the, in the adventure in the airport, um, there was a woman who was in a wheelchair. I mean, she could get up and walk, but she couldn't walk the distance, right? So she's sitting there waiting for a flight to Charlotte, and that was one way to change the game. And so one of the, you know, agents comes over and says, well, we'll get, we'll get an agent to wheel you down to the next gate. Well, time's going on. Here she sits, here she sits, here she sits, you know. And initially I said, you know, if you want me to, I'll push you down there. I'm not doing anything except sitting here. You know, after you're sitting in an airport for about so long, you run out of things to talk about. You run out of things that you want to read, even if you have it with you. You know, it's just, there it is. Yeah, no, 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 they're sending somebody. And after a while, it sort of got later and later. I knew the flight was coming up. And I said, you know, you really need to get down there. Are you sure you don't want me to, you know, would you? Sure. <laughs> And it's it like says she didn't know how to ask you if you could. Well, the th I asked her a second time because I saw her sitting there and I figured that plane is going, you know, they're yeah. closing the doors in 15 minutes and it's probably a, you know, 10 minute walk down there because again, you know, yeah. lots of real estate there. So, you know, and now is that an opportunity to witness? Sure. What was the witness? Just that act. All right. And I thought about it afterwards. Well, should I said something about Jesus? Well, I don't know. I was wearing a shirt that says Jesus is greater on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's just going to have to speak. You know? Right. Uh, right. Right. Because you're in that kind of setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but how many people will oftentimes go, hey, I really like your shirt? I mean, I just thought that and yeah. said to Nancy this morning, think that. Yeah, I really like your sweater. Yeah. And people do that with our, our clothing frequently. So it's it's one of those things where there's a lot of simple ways one can do this. And we right? had our St. John's school uh, emblem on our car. So mm -hmm. yeah. to let people know that if they would want, they could. And boy, that's a reminder to behave yourself. Yes. <laughs> Well, you know, some people wear crosses as a fashion accessory, and I typically am not out in public unless I'm wearing one, but I have to always remember I'm representing Jesus in how I act and how I treat people. Even without wearing a cross, you still represent Jesus. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. You know, before the masks, was, I, yep. I have a habit of doing something, and I don't know how other people... Yeah. But I would smile and say good morning. Absolutely. Yeah, something like that. And every time you would see a smile from that. Right yeah. And and recognize we live in a world, all right, where often in the circles we run in, we take kindness almost for granted because this is the way we seek to treat each other. We're not always perfect. We blow it on a regular basis. <laughs> we seek to treat each other this way. But we live in a world where there are other souls out there. They rarely are treated kindly. And that in itself can be powerful. There does come a point where the Holy Spirit kind of taps you on the shoulder and says, now talk about Jesus now. And that we've got to pay attention to. Because kindness is not going to bring people into the kingdom of God. The gospel is. The gospel alone. And the heart of the gospel is Christ crucified, risen. You know, that reminds me. You go shopping and people say, have a nice day. Right. I always look at them and say, may the Lord bless your day. And so many times I have had people say, thank you. Yeah. Well, it's even, you know, it occurred to me because, you know, I've been thinking about some of these things in a variety of contexts, and I'm starting to sprinkle that in at the door as children leave. In other words, have a good evening, have a blessed evening. It's just a little language change. There was a guy right? that used to, when I was the office manager at uh, Jack D, the Chevy dealer, um, when he, he was one that did, came in, he took the dents out of vehicles. And he always would say, if you said, hey, how are you, Keith? I'm blessed. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's a Pastor Randy Glander thing, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, we remember now. Yeah, it's, 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 it, what, did it, what did it take him? Six weeks of standing up and say, how are you? Before people finally say, I'm blessed. <laughs> Man, are we slow learners, aren't we? <laughs> if it's a bad day, I'll say I'm blessed and stressed. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. And you know, it doesn't take a lot. No, to to be nice. No, I you know because it's just I mean, and it's nothing that you feel it's worried about. It's just no. be nice, you know. And if uh, a lot of people maybe are not feeling so well today or something like that, and you don't know what you're doing to them uh, as you speak to them recognize though that's the holy spirit working in us i mean there are other souls on the planet who think being nice is a waste of time and they live accordingly mm -hmm. you know it you occasionally run into those folks mm -hmm. it's kind of like whoo hey wow god love you, <laughs> you <know? laughs> but you gotta mean it <laughs> okay <laughs> You got to mean it. Um, oh, sure. Oh, sure. Okay. So the power of God for salvation, the gospel in Acts chapter one, at the beginning of that chapter, we have Jesus ascending into heaven. One of the things he says to his disciples just before he ascends is in Acts one eight, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Let's pause there. Where's the power coming from? The Holy Spirit. The power that we have to demonstrate that genuine kindness and compassion of God comes from the Holy Spirit. The power we have to witness to Christ comes from the Holy Spirit. It all is from him. If we begin to think it's us, we're setting ourselves up for a lot of heart. Right? So you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. So when the Spirit is living within us, which he started doing at our baptism, yes? Still there. Um, we are also his witnesses. In the case of the disciples in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So let's think about this. Jerusalem is, this is where we're right now living, right? So if we were to translate this for us, you will be my witnesses in Kendallville, in a villa, and, you know, there it is, right? And then Judea, which is kind of like, okay, these are people like us, but they're a little farther away, so we might be at Fort Wayne or South Bend or, you know. And then Samaria, Ah, close by the people who are not like us. So that might be the residents of the mosque down the road. Okay, very different culture right here. And then, of course, to the ends of the earth, which is pretty much everything. So there's four distinct people groups there. People who are like us who are close. People who are like us who are a little farther away. People who are close who are not like us. And then everybody. When the boys had to memorize this verse, it was fifth grade, I think, but maybe it was fourth grade. I'm always having such a hard time getting it. And he has a hard time getting it. Mm -hmm. So Charis was using the same examples for him. Yep. So when he had to recite it in school, those would be. He changed it from Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to all those places that Jerus had. Yeah. The... Yeah. Hey. But and, he and got that's it. okay. That's okay. But, and that's really, you know, the heart of the scripture, mm -hmm. right? And and ultimately, and, and let me just kind of pull that little thread out of there. In the armor of God described in Ephesians chapter six, we are told we have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. In the Greek language of the first century, in Koine Greek, you have two words for the word word. You with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. One logos is exact, perfect representation. This is the spelling test answer. So when you go to John chapter one, 
In the beginning was the word, the Logos, and the Logos was God, and the Logos was with God. This is the exact representation of God, Jesus is. Curiously, Paul, who is not only trained as a rabbi and has all of that background, but is trained in, in the classic way of Roman speech, does not use logos when he talks about the sword of the spirit. He uses the other Greek word, rima, which is utterance or saying what that person would say. Utterance, no, I mean, rima is, is, that, is the transliterated sound of it. Okay. And so ultimately, in, in the example of Hunter, that's rima. If Jesus were standing here, you know, ascending to heaven from Kendallville, what would he say? Boom, 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 boom. Right? Saying what he would say. That sounds like God. So I don't know about you, but there was a point in my life where it's like, man, if I'm going to say something out of the Bible, I better get it right. Or if I can't, I better not say it until I, until I heard that and realized Holy Spirit's in it. Even if I misquote a little bit, as long as I'm not completely, you know, going the opposite right. direction to say what God says. And we all kind of know what God says, right? We've been after it for a while. So even if we don't have it perfectly memorized, we can say what God says. And that also is witness. And guess whose power is in that? Not mine, Holy Spirit's, right? So ultimately, as we think about this, um, we'll take a look at Luke in a minute, but I want to take us to 1 Corinthians 15, because this is the message that they were to take out, okay? In 1 Corinthians 15, Corinthians, by the way, 1 Corinthians anyway, is one of the earliest New Testament books written as far as we know. I knew that it's a so in 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 3, the Apostle Paul describes the gospel. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. The heart of the gospel is this, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That's the little piece there in verse 3 that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and then he appears, he rose. We know that, right? He died for us, he was buried, he rose. If I know that, I know the changing message of the gospel, that powerful message that the Holy Spirit's power is in. So while it's good to know all this other stuff, this is it. This is the heart of it, right? This is the heart of it. And ultimately, this is the message that was taken out into the world, first by Peter and John and Philip and all of those folks, and later by Saul, who is now Paul. And ultimately, by us, right? We hear this message every week right here. And it never gets old. No. We have to keep hearing it because there's no other message like it. It's unique. And it's, you know, it's the same every week. Mm -hmm. But it's also living in that it's different every week. Like, mm -hmm. I never really, my brain never focused on that word daily. Yeah. And then today it did. And yeah. It, <laughs> the depth of the scriptures is just beyond. It's just beyond us. It's just beyond us. So this power of the gospel for salvation, we've kind of looked at what that is. 
The Holy Spirit fills us. It leads to witness. It leads to people then responding in the Holy Spirit's power on that. God acts and the response occurs. Another place we kind of see this early on is in Luke chapter 1. In verse 35, we have, you know, Mary talking to the angel Gabriel. And the angel says to Mary, when she says, how is it possible that I'm going to be pregnant with the Savior? The angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One born to you will be called the Son of God. So the Holy Spirit is in the business of bringing life where there is none. Now, in this case, brings the physical life of Jesus. In our case, brings that spiritual life in Christ where there was none. At the end of the day, <coughs> that's the message we have. And guess what? Let's take the pressure off. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings the change. I simply need to live as Jesus did with these people. And when the Holy Spirit kind of says, okay, say something now, I have to do that. <laughs> okay. I'm such a relief my friend Jerry, who um, been witness to a, a friend of his. And um, he was, like many of us, I was like that at a point in time, but he was so worried about what if the person doesn't believe me you know what happens what happens and i was so happy to actually be able to tell him you've done your part you know, right you shared it i said your responsibility is not it's done that's just god it's god's turn right our responsibility is to share the good news our responsibility is and to pray for that seed. person and stay connected that's it. You know, it, 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 it sounds easy because we're living in a spiritual war. It's often difficult, right? It is very simple. It's not complicated. A two-year-old can get this idea, right? Jesus died for me and he rose again. A two-year-old can do that. You know, the little three-year-olds, we have... Uh, well, actually, it's four-year-olds that we have preschool chapel. But the little four-year-olds, they know it. They know it. At least they got it in their heads, right? It's still working into their lives. But I would suggest that in the 94-year-olds, it's still working into your life. Right. But isn't that why God, Jesus said, let the children come to me? Absolutely. Because the children, Absolutely. Believe, the children believe almost everything that you tell them. Yep. And without question. Yep. Or an adult, if they, you know, are told something, they'll question it. Yes. Adults, adults have learned skepticism. Well, and also uh -huh. adults, well, kids, it's simplistic to them. Mm hmm and adults complicate things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we do make some things complex that are not complex. <laughs> well, I think when it comes to adults, it's when Jesus charged his disciples to go out and preach the gospel. And when you go into a town, if they accept you, stay there. But if yeah. you don't, it's not your responsibility as you leave. Correct. To dust off your feet. Yes, and that dust itself will be a testimony. Mm -hmm. and, and, and recognize, we'll look at this when we get to verse 18, which won't be today, but when we get to verse 18, we'll look at this, that the scriptures very clearly declare that God has made himself known to every human being. Unfortunately, tragically, many human beings suppress the truth. So when we witness, even if the person is like, uh-uh, we have an ally inside because inside the truth is testifying, right? Mm -hmm. And some pilgrims are just very, very stubborn and will be stubborn all the way to hell. Others might be stubborn in our presence, but eventually break down, right? Yeah. And, we want, and we don't know. We want that person to be in heaven. 
Correct. But it, it Correct. Is a relief to know that you, if it doesn't happen, it wasn't your fault kind of thing. You Correct. Know? I mean, it, it, you, it, you planted the seed. And this is, this is part of the mystery that's beyond. There was a conversation that I was a, a part of um, yesterday um, where we have a grandparent who has unbaptized grandchildren and kind of is trying to, you know, hey, what's going on here? And is getting stonewalled, right? Um, and ultimately the question was, if I get to heaven, and they aren't there, will I still be joyful? Or will I just forget they ever were? Deep thinking. Huh? Yes, it is. But guess what? It, you got those little issues that come up, right? Absolutely. And, and the answer that, that kind of was put into the room was, well, first of all, heaven is a place of joy beyond imagining. So there is nothing that will reduce that joy. Um, will you forget loved ones who didn't know Jesus? Not necessarily, but in remembering them, there will not be a lessening of the joy. And how all that works, I don't know. Okay. But the other conversation was it's not about the baptism. Go to your child, go to their spouse, however it works, talk to them together, and simply ask the question hey, what's going on with you and Jesus? Because both of these parents were raised as Christians and at one point were active. And now this is not the case. What's going on with you and Jesus? Because that's the real issue. If the relationship with Jesus was right, baptism wouldn't be an issue, right? The relationship with Jesus is the problem. Then I said, then you have to bite your tongue, bleed if you have to, it doesn't matter. You cannot speak. You have to listen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you understand how hard that is, right? I mean, you know, and I, I'm talking to myself too because there, you know, there are some situations in my life where it's like I would just like to, you know, spend five minutes and tell you what you should do with your life. Um, you know, and all you have to do is listen to me, and life will be good. Except it's not. That's not the way it works, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it is simply not the way it works. Dad said to me yesterday so, or the day before, he was upset again that Lily hadn't been baptized. And I don't know how Jill would feel about it if she knew that she had been. Uh -huh. um, so I don't really talk about it that much. Right. Yes. But Paul's and... like Chris one Sunday said, you know, you can baptize it yourself. Yeah. And so I said to dad, I said, she's been baptized. She has? <laughs> I said, I baptized her. Yeah. You you did? Who was there? Me, God, the Holy Spirit, and Lily. Yep. <laughs> well, and, and recognize that is a situation that is fraught with peril. Right? And yet we prayerfully follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. We prayerfully follow. You know, and, and it's one of those where we love these little children. And, you know, the other thing we said is, look, they're a grandparent. There's birthdays. There's Christmas. There's, hey, it's Tuesday. I brought you something. Right? Bring the faith materials. When they start to read, there are some wonderful early reader Bibles. Guess who's got a reader? When you're there, now grandchild is not in, you know, it's like you've got to travel to get there kind of a thing, so it's not like they're down the block. But when you visit, you say, hey, we want to read a story out of that Bible we gave you? Oh, yeah. And then you sit there and read it. With them. Right? And unless the parents are like, absolutely not, you're not going to do this, and this is not that situation. Some situations are like that, right? Some situations are very difficult. And you don't know, we talked about that childlike faith, you don't know that sometimes it isn't the child that brings the parents back. I've been connected to Lutheran schools long enough to see it more than once. Okay. Which is part of the reason why I work so much with Lily. Absolutely. Because you just don't know what you're building into her life that's going to come back to mom. And sometimes 
you know, the adults won't pay any attention to us, right? They will pay attention to their children. Sometimes. So we work, you know, another reason we need to fight at whatever level it takes to continue the ministry of St. John Luther School. Because we've got children here who come from homes who aren't in church. Period. And guess what? They hear about Jesus here every day. They hear about him every day. And, and that, you don't know what the Holy Spirit's going to do with them. We don't know how those stories are going to come out, right? We just don't know. We just don't know. And the culture is getting more and more anti-Christian all the time. I don't think, I could be wrong. I do not believe that the majority of citizens in the United States of America are anti-Christian. But there are some very organized, vocal forces that are anti-Christian. And if they had their way, they'd get rid of all the churches. They'd well, all be look, at, look at Sundays. At one time, I mean, geez, when, when I was raising my kids, I mean, everything was closed on Sunday. Yes. Look at it today. It's all... Yes. Is it can we blame big business? We blame Walmart, Walmart running around. I guess. Well, I, I think part of it, and and Nia, you're not going to like what I have to say here, but I think we have to start by looking in the mirror and say, what did we? I shopped it. Now, permit. So well, but what did we permit to happen? Where were the Christian voices saying we need a time to do Sabbath for God, right? Sabbath is a lost concept in our culture. Sabbath is not a law, it's a gift. And the gift is this, I can stop going like crazy to take care of myself and just spend some time thanking God for all of his provision and care in my life. Um, an individual who wrote a book called Keeping the Sabbath Holy um, with W-H-O-L-E-Y, in other words, fully. Her name is Marva Dawn. I think she's in heaven now. Not absolutely sure on that one. But you know, phenomenal theologian who can make it understandable. And she talks about when she was going back to school to get her PhD. And at that point, she'd already done a lot of study on Sabbath. She had a couple of tests on Monday of that week. If you don't pass them, you don't get in. And so she she had a very real choice to make because this was whole career thing, you know. Um, do I study on Sunday or do I take Sabbath? She took Sabbath. She's got a doctorate. She's like chariots. She was fighting chariots of fire the other day. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and, yeah, and it yeah, just, I thought about that in a long time. I haven't seen it in a long time. You know, it, 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 it's one of those things where it's a gift and, you know, guilty. A lot of times I don't do the gift, right? But it's a gift to us. It's a gift to us. And it's a gift to the culture. You know, the Jewish culture, when they were keeping Sabbath, was very, very different from anything around them because everybody else went Sunday's week. And these insane Jews took a day off. And when they were following God, guess who was blessed more? <laughs> when they weren't following God, yeah, then not so much, right? <laughs> but one of the first things that went was the Sabbath. And I think part of it is as a Christian church, you know, we needed to add, you know, this is really best for society if, not, if things aren't open 24-7. You know, what about this? What about, you know, there's always ways to work around stuff. Right? There's always ways to get it done. So at any rate, um, I guess we're picking it up in the middle of verse 16 here. <laughs>
That's um, sad. We couldn't even get through a whole verse. No, well, <laughs> these two verses have quite a bit stuffed into them. So <laughs> they will pick up. Well, I don't know if it'll pick up a whole lot more when we get to 18 to the end of the chapter, because <laughs> that's just, oh, my goodness. Um, there will be sections where we'll move a little faster. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, um, so places we, we I read something yeah. on Facebook the other day that I really don't pay too much attention to. So Billy Graham's son was, was saying that he had um, an anniversary of his death. He said, I'm not dying. I'm just changing residence. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 The, the very first church I served, and oh man, if I, I don't, I can see their faces, but the names are not one. But it was a husband and his wife and one of their sisters. I don't remember at this point whether it was her sister or his sister, but they, you know, elderly, household together, things were working fine, and he died. And you know how this works, where you've got somebody on the phone, answer the phone, hey, is so-and-so there? Um, and of course, it was a call for him. And this was probably, you know, a month or so after the funeral. And uh, as she recounted the story, she says, no, he's gone on to heaven. <laughs> you can reach him there. <laughs> I don't think she added that part. I would have, but, you know. <laughs> um, but no, he's gone on to heaven. And it's just like, yep, that's really what it is, right? You've gone on to heaven. And, you know, I've got a lot of people I know who've just gone on to heaven, right? And that, that, is, the, that is the amazing part of this thing. It's like, yep, I'm going to see him again. Whenever Jesus is done with me here, I'm going to go on to heaven too. So, well, good to be with you. Um, just powerful, powerful message that we have, right? And the encouragement here is, as we have opportunity, we share it. And we trust the Holy Spirit's going to do something with it. Those who have studied people coming to faith, it rarely happens on a single event. It is normally a whole series of events. And often, we are one of those pieces, and we don't see the stuff that came before, and we don't see the stuff that came after. But we're one of the little pieces, right? So, let's pray, shall we? Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Amen. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So good to be with you, and I guess we will continue right here next week. So, right. Mary, how you doing, Mary? We'll talk about it when we have time to talk. I love your beard.